this time on the Families Matter Most podcast. I really believe all behavior is communication. Oh, so good. So, you know, what's what you see on the surface is the tears. You see the anger. Maybe you see the hitting or the biting. Maybe you see retreating. Maybe you see mm. shutting down. But if you keep peeling that onion back, you might find out a little bit more information that will help you to solve that problem with your child or with your student. Every time Jen Dean speaks, I can see hope, knowledge, expertise, wisdom, and love. When Jen Dean speaks about parenting, we make sure that we are there to listen because we know we will get valuable advice. Families Matter Most with Jen Dean. She doesn't just give skills for us to be better parents, but she teaches us how to reach our children's hearts. And at the end of the day, that's what truly matters. Welcome to the Families Matter Most podcast. It's Jen, your family coach, and I'm here with a special guest who's going to help us as we try to reach the hearts of our kids. Julie, thanks for coming. Thank you so much for having me. Julie Sims is an educator. She is a learning resource teacher, and I feel like she's in this unique position to help us as we're trying to help our kids. So she helps parents. She helps kids with learning resources. She helps teachers. So I feel like, Julie, you have this unique experience of being present in all of these different spheres. So you're gonna share your wisdom today. So tell me, how did you get to be a learning resource teacher? I've been a teacher since 2009, and I had gone kind of back and forth to home and school and kind of the positions that presented themselves as opportunities to teach in different capacities. And that was going really well. It worked well to work half time when my kids were little. And then as I got a little further in and then started to take Uh, the longer contracts and the more full-time positions, I really started to notice the many varied needs that were coming into the classroom Mm -hmm. as far as not only children's academic capacity, but the different behavior and the social needs that were there. And so I ended up pursuing some further education um, a few years ago. So that was about five years ago that I started it. One One course at a time, very slowly, went back to university. Um, So I ended up pursuing an inclusive education certificate program. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. At that time, I I did it just so I could have more tools in my toolbox and become a better classroom teacher. But what I didn't know at the time is that as I was ending that certificate program, an opportunity would present itself at the school where I was working Mm -hmm. um, and and a job opening came I felt a little intimidated at first and I thought, well, who am I? What can I offer? I felt very green in that capacity, but I knew that with my experience and with my new education, I I did feel like I had something to offer. There was a little glimmer of uh, maybe I could do this. So so this is what you trained for. Literally, this was your heart. That's right. But you know, have you heard of imposter syndrome? I can <laughs> never, say never. I've, that is kind of what I experienced. And so it took some bravery and some guts to say yes. Mm. And I've been so pleasantly surprised just to see how well it has gone. Um, you know, I realized very early there's a lot to learn here now that my feet are on the ground in this job. But I had a lot of great colleagues and a lot of administrative support. Um, and so it's it's now two years in and I'm feeling really good about it. Ah, tell me just what comes to mind if I ask you what your sweet spot is. For me, I think because I was one and I, and I have one (laughs) and I kind of still am one strong willed kids are like my jam. It's like, Mm. I I feel like I understand them. I feel like they're my people. We get each other. That's kind of my, that's my sweet spot. Like, do you have a certain area that you feel like this is my expertise? I think I definitely can connect with the kids that are having some emotional difficulties. Mm. And I think that comes partly from being a mom and just having to learn how important it is to really get on your kids level with where they're at, what they can handle, what their capacity is um, emotionally, because that really can determine what they're able to do as far as problem solving and to, um, you know, show other skills in their lives. And so those students really have my heart. I can, you know, students that are struggling in that area, my heart does go out to them. And so I feel like by learning about them, what makes them tick, what helps mm-hmm. them be strong, getting to the heart of them helps form a relationship within which then allows me to 
help them um, in other areas or, you know, academic or kind of the different needs that they have. So let's walk through a scenario and I'm, I'm throwing you on the spot, but you're going to, it's going to be great. This is so common. (laughs) You would experience this probably in your role as teacher, but also in your role as mom. Mm -hmm. So let's say there is a child that struggles with anger and there's another child that struggles with sadness, tears. How would you handle that? And I'm thinking, you know, regulation are buzzwords that are really big right now. Resilience with the skills and the tools that you have now don't do what I did as a mom mm. and just get mad at them. Yeah. What would you do? What would you offer to parents that might maybe have kids that are struggling with these emotions? The first thing that I can say is I really believe all behavior is communication. Oh, so good. So, you know, what's what you see on the surface is the tears. You see the anger. Maybe you see the hitting or the biting. Maybe you see retreating. Maybe you see shutting Mm. down yeah so something that i practice daily like it's true there's many examples i could draw from but a script i've adopted is to say it looks like you're having a hard time with and then naming what it is that they're going through so maybe a child is having trouble being kind to their friends they're kicking their buddies as they're you know coming to stand in line or they just can't help themselves but steal the ball so rather than saying you're stealing the ball. Stop that. Why are you doing that? Or quit kicking your friends. You know, that's not how we act in our classroom. Mm. You, you just step back for a second, just zoom out and, and talk to the child. And so I find it quite effective if I can come with a calm demeanor and spirit and level with the child, you know, first of all, naming the big emotions. I can tell you're really angry right now. Yeah. Yeah. So and so, da da da. You know, and they're kind of they might name what's going on or complain no exactly, yeah. Yeah. or a behavior like maybe stealing the ball, or maybe they're hitting their brother, or whatever the thing is. You're having a really hard time being kind. Yeah, and then they'll you know defend themselves and whatever. But if you keep peeling that onion back, and if oh. you keep <laughs> going underneath those yeah. layers, you might find out a little bit more information that will help you to solve that problem with your child or with your student. Mm. And it would take a little longer than stop that. What's wrong with you? Why are you still doing that? Quit it. Like it takes a little longer. And I think something that you mentioned that's really hard for us to do, particularly I think when it's our own kids is that whole being calm. Oh yeah. (laughs) Staying calm and being able to step back and zoom out is so hard to do sometimes. It can be so hard in the moment. And so something I've been practicing or trying more lately is to go, okay, I know what my kids' triggers are. I know what things are going to set them off right now. They're having a really hard time in this area. So anticipate that Mm. and be ready. Come to the situation with the knowledge that this might not go well. They might freak out at me. They might hit Mm. back or they might scream at me. But it can be really tempting to try and move past big emotions and difficult situations as quickly as possible because it's uncomfortable for everybody who's involved. It's uncomfortable for the parent. It's overwhelming. It's super challenging. Um, the child is clearly, especially if there's a lot of noise, if, if their behavior can, is um, outrageous, if it's, yes. if it's destructive, if it's all if of those public things. and it's embarrassing. Oh, so it can be so embarrassing. I've yep. had a lot of things happen like that. Um, but just... If you can at all have the capacity and just know in your head, you know what? They're probably going to make a scene. They might freak out a little bit right now. I can be calm, Mm. you know, kind of train your brain and kind of prepare yourself (laughs) to come into that uh, situation. (laughs) That's, that's what I spend most of my time doing as a parent (laughs) coach, Julie. That's really it is how, like, how can we show up? Right. If we want our kids to be regulated. Yes. Yes. We have to go first. Yeah, for sure. And and I love that if you know there's something coming, then we need to be prepared ourselves. So how can we show up, be able to be present? Mm -hmm. Well, and I find taking the time to to acknowledge emotions goes such a long way. Mm. So, you know, don't focus so much on the wrong behavior you think that they're choosing, but naming those big behaviors and then see what happens. Like I encourage any parents who are listening to do an experiment to say, I I notice you're having a difficult time with... A, B, or C. Name the emotion. Mm -hmm. Mm. So I would say name the thing that they're having difficulty with 
And then also take time to say, it looks like you're really frustrated with this right now, or maybe you're really embarrassed. I have a couple of stories just about my son, actually, that I thought could be oh. good to highlight. Just a couple of examples. He's yes. our youngest. He's eight. And, you know, my girls are a little older and have come along in their emotional development. But this summer, we were at the beach and my son was digging in the sand with his kit, with his friends. And he started digging really quickly and he sprayed a whole bunch of adults behind him with, with sand. Yeah. And everyone went, whoa, 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 whoa. And of course, everyone kind of stops and looks, you know, what's going on. And my son was really embarrassed and he started crying and he, you know, didn't want to talk to me. He was trying to run away. And so rather than say, look what you did, like you spray them, go apologize right now. I took a few minutes and I just, I sat with him while he was sad and I talked to him. I said, you probably feel embarrassed right now, don't you? He said, yeah. Mm. And so we just sat together and I knew we still wanted to make it right, but he needed to calm down and to regulate first before we could form an apology. And then he did that successfully later and everything was okay. But if I hadn't, you know, if I had forced him in his tears and his anger and embarrassment to go and make an apology, it just wouldn't have been a very effective learning time for mm-hmm. him. Like a forced apology is is not going to be, you know, sincere. Absolutely. I love that. And I think, I think sometimes the pushback we might get when both you, Julie, and, and myself in our work, we're spending a lot of time helping parents to be calm, to stay calm, to talk about the feelings mm-hmm. in ourselves and in our kids. Uh, and some might say, well, there has to be consequences. Like they have to learn. Mm-hmm. They should still, yeah. they should still have to, Good point. And and I feel like, I think you addressed that here, Julie, there's still, yes, there still sometimes does have to be a consequence, but it's not effective if we're just forcing kids to do something. Yeah. And we've all been fake apologized to. Yeah. <laughs> that is not helpful, especially in sibling relationships. I've worked with families where a parent will say like, you hurt your brother, you apologize right now. And then and then the sister will be like, sorry, exactly. I'm so sorry. And then th- and then we say, no, you, brother, you need to forgive your sister. <laughs> what is that? I, I feel like that's not all it's doing is adding to the resentment yeah. for the siblings. Yeah, no, that's true. And I, I usually say to my kids something like, I can see how you're feeling from the look on your face. And I know that you're not sorry, or I know yes. that you don't mean that because, you know, yes. their hearts kind of come out <laughs> in, their, in their expressions. It's pretty obvious. Yeah. So taking that time to help them to get calm and then solve the problem. That's right. So we're dealing with the emotions first, mm-hmm. then we'll deal with the behavior. Yeah, and it can be hard and it, and it can take um, some patience and some time to take that step back. But I promise that if you if you try it or make a little bit of a habit of it, mm-hmm. that will become easier. And I will also say, you know, there's something to be said about continuing to work on yourself because as parents, as adults, as humans, we certainly aren't perfect. We have big emotions. We fly off yes. the handle. Yes. And so for somebody to get in our face to say, you know, to force an apology or to instill a consequence that maybe is unfair or something like that, mm-hmm. just, you know. And so I've also found that being humble with my kids and apologizing, you know, after I have raised my voice or maybe not been fair and how I've treated them or demanding certain things of mm-hmm. them, that goes quite a long way. Yeah, what if we say not if you make that mistake with your kids, <laughs> yeah. but when? When you do. When you do. And it's not all terrible, actually. There's lots of good things to be said for modeling to our kids that mm-hmm. this is how we repair. That's right, yeah. When when we make a mistake, we go back and say, you know what, I'm really sorry. That's that's not how I want to handle things. Will you forgive me? Can we try this yeah. again? Yeah, definitely. Isn't that what we want our kids to do? Mm-hmm. Oh, so good. Now, Julie, I have a question for you about the classroom in particular, but I think this applies for home. Like it it takes more time to be a teacher that you're able to stop and have these conversations with your kids. Do you need to manage your time differently? Do you need to, do you need to make sure you have time set aside? Cause I'm thinking about parents. We tend to over schedule. We tend to have these crazy long to-do lists. And for, for me to suggest to parents, you know, (laughs) you need, you need to have these conversations, maybe 10, 15, 20 times a day, Mm if you're home with your kids, worth it, yes. But is it the same for teachers? Like they have to actually have time set aside to be able to do this. So at home, I mean, it depends on kind of if you, if you work outside the home or inside the home or kind of what your life looks like. Mm. But I would just say to take the time when you can, even in small 
ways to have consistent forms of communication. So in my role as learning resource teacher, I do have capacity and I do have kind of time spots or I maybe I'm called to certain situations where there's been an escalation and I need to go and help. And so I do have that capacity, which is a beautiful thing about my job. And so I'm able to go for walks and to talk about Mm -hmm. feelings and those things that are happening. And I do support teachers in that as well. And on the home front, this was a couple months ago now, but my son was not wanting to, I had asked him to go upstairs and to clean up his clothes because they were kind of on his floor. And it was just one of those typical Saturday, we're getting stuff done. Okay, go clean up your room. Yeah. And he's, he, (laughs) this thing happens to his legs when I ask him to do something. (laughs) All of a sudden they're very sore and tired. Yeah. And they don't work suddenly. Interesting. So so the legs were really sore that Saturday morning. (laughs) I went upstairs and I said, looks like you're having a hard time getting started on your room. Tell me what's going on. And so he kind of, you know, was whining a bit at first, but then he said, I don't know how to my, to fold my clothes and I don't want to do it. Uh. I said, okay. It took everything in me not to say, we've done this over and over and over again. Like, mm-hmm. you know how to fold a t-shirt by now, but he actually really was struggling still. And so I think sometimes, you know, those opportunities when there is communication to say, I don't know how to do that or I don't want to do that or they're showing you with your their behavior they they are having trouble meeting that adult expectation they don't actually have that skill and so um, by taking that time even though you feel like you've done it a thousand times you know cleaning up your room is a good example actually because we can say go clean up your room but there's toys and there's clothes and the bed is messy like it is quite an overwhelming task actually to ask kids to do it's a lot of steps especially if you've got a child that struggles with distraction sure yeah. diagnosed or undiagnosed it is a lot and i like to say it's their it's their favorite place it's filled with all of their favorite things like <laughs> yeah. julie i don't know like if i sent you to your favorite store yeah. <laughs> and said don't touch anything just only do these couple of things like that would be so tempting <laughs> oh man i don't think i could do it winners would be the would be the tricky one for me <laughs> right so i i think you're right i think it's more overwhelming than we realize for sure so rather than disciplining him or, or giving him a punishment for not doing what I said when I said it, you know, mm. I'm, you know, I'm expecting obedience and you're supposed to do this when I say it, we took the time and I said, okay, let's sit down together. And so we practiced it again. And since then, like I said, that was a couple of months ago, things have actually improved. So, I mean, if I can give any encouragement, it would just be to keep on consistently working on that training. So whatever the expected behavior is that you are asking of your child, Mm. make sure that it's a fair ask. Make sure they actually have the skills to do that thing. And I'm not just talking about folding laundry. I'm talking about emotional responses or appropriate ways of talking to adults or even expectations Mm. for maybe how to do certain chores or if a kid is very forgetful, you know, and they never remember to put their piano books away or something like that. Yes. Like really step back and say, okay, do they actually have the skill to do what I want them to do? Because if you find yourself saying the same thing over and over and over again and getting exasperated, take a step back and say, okay, can they actually do this? Right. Because if you find yourself saying the same thing over and over again, there's a chance that maybe your expectation is too high of them in that area. And so that's when you can take a step back and say, okay, we've got to do some more practice in this area. Mm, Even emotionally, are they capable? One of my kids has a hard time with overstimulation. Mm. And when he was younger, I learned the hard way that we could not do a birthday party and a shopping trip Mm. in the same day, like a big, you know, like a Costco or a super, like a whole two hour, you know, shopping adventure. We couldn't do them both in the same day. It was just too much. And I learned that the hard way. And I think as parents, we are making plans or we're mm, expecting yes. things out of our kids based on our own development. Totally. But we've had a few more years. Yeah. Um, and I can remember even saying to my kids, oh, we got a busy day, guys. We got a busy day. We got people coming over for supper. We got to clean. We got to yeah. do this. Come on. And just saying that doesn't actually make them able to handle it. Yeah. No, that's <laughs> totally true. So how did you learn? Like, what were the signs for you when you knew, okay, this is too much for him to handle? This is too much for him. Well, this, my particular child his overstimulation presented as oppositional defiance. Mm. So it was very obvious when he was done and he'd have too much. It was very obvious to me, to everyone around. If we were in public, it was just full on rage. So it would present as anger. 
I can remember doing the walk of shame. We had done groceries and then we'd gone to get a birthday gift and then we'd gone to bowling. So it was like, wow, like, that's a, that sounds like a very big day. Right. I should have known. <laughs> <laughs> so we walked down. So in this bowling, we walked down these steps and there's music and there's lights and just think about it. Now, now that I know what I know, completely overstimulating kids and it's loud and we take two steps in and my kid just rage, just tantrum. Aww. He's old. He's about seven, eight years old. He's old enough that he's like kicking me and punching me and he's just, he's lost it. Poor guy. And so I had to, <laughs> I had to like, at this point we do like this football hold. Yeah. And I just gave the gift to the oh. other mom. I was oh. like, sorry, we, we just, we just got to get out of here. And we went home and he just needed calm, quiet. We learned through experiences like that. At that time he could handle like one exciting, stimulating thing yeah. in a, in a day. So morning, afternoon, evening, whatever one was, the next one had to be quiet and calm. And in fact, working on it, he even learned that himself and he learned how to have someone boundary. So we'd we'd be home and maybe there's company over and he'd say to me, he'd say, mom, uh, can I go to your room for a while? And that was our code. And he Aww. would know that our room was a safe place. Other kids weren't allowed in there. He could go sit and he would like it quiet. He would listen to an audio book. He would have the lights off and it would just help him to deescalate. And That's so amazing. he learned strategies and we worked together on it. But it was one of those things we had to learn kind of through trial and error. And we figured it out the hard way. But it was a lot of me trying to force him to just be fine. And he was not fine. He couldn't do it. It was beyond what he was capable of. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and why could I expect more of him than that? So I think yeah. that's fast. Is this a skill issue that we got to work on? Or is just this is this something beyond what they're emotionally capable of right now? Sure. Yeah. So what do you think about the word resilience? Do you think this is how our kids build resilience or do you have other strategies? You know, we we build resilience our whole lives long. And so I think part of that is becoming emotionally intelligent and having those skills to identify, you know, difficulties that you have because every every individual is just so unique in their mm. capacity to handle different things in life. So I actually wanted to just bring up a website and kind of a strategy yes. that um, where I have just had some training from our school psychologist, actually. The author of the book, uh, Lives in the Balance, and also that started the website, Lives in the Balance, is where I take my a lot of this practice that I'm talking about and the problem solving. Mm. So the website says the strategy is to help kids solve problems that are causing their concerning behavior without shame, blame, or conflict. So what we do first is we notice the concerning behaviors, um, and, and that tells us that they're having trouble meeting the adult expectations. And like I had said before, if they don't have the skill to meet the adult expectation, that's when we're going to see behavior. Ah, I think um, that's key. I wait, I th wait, you're just moving past that. <laughs> you're, Julie's moving past it, but I think... A lot of us are like, wait, wait a minute. If they don't have the skill to meet the adult expectation, that's when we see the behavior. Correct. Could we underline that? <laughs> could we? Really? We could chew on that for days. What kids can do, though, is after they, you know, have when that empathy step comes in and when you're talking about it and identifying it, now you have somewhere to start a plan from similar to how you would have with your yes. son. And you said it was a lot of trial and error mm -hmm. and it can be hard and it can be humbling, too, as a parent. And I do find this a little bit as I'm walking with families through maybe a new diagnosis or a difficulty in school, not just academic, but maybe behaviorally or socially parents can I think they can kind of take it on themselves or maybe feel like it's a reflection mm. maybe of their parenting or something like that. And there are a lot of elements that, um, you know, would be part of a child's capacity and how they act and everything. But um, as far as resilience, the, the problem solving skills that we develop, you know, early in life and as we continue to develop helps us to be adaptable and flexible and to be able to tolerate frustration, to regulate our emotions. And if you think about, you know, the children we're raising and the students who we're bringing up in school, like we're going to come along, we're going to learn our academics, we're going to do all of those things. But 
preparing our children with these skills will help them to do well their whole life long, whether it's school, whether it's, Mm -hmm. you know, a group project, whether it's their first job, whether it's working at a church camp or many of those different things. So I think that's why I'm so passionate about it is because I just see such a value as, you know, just a really foundational piece of childhood. So as we consider everything, (laughs) this is so good. I just want to, I want to remind everyone, there's going to be links to everything we've talked about today. We're going to have links to that website in the show notes page. We're going to have a download with some of just the, some of the underlined things in my own mind, the things that I want (laughs) to put on my fridge. We're going to have a, Something you can print off. You still put things on your fridge? Doesn't everybody? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I do. Does Sean let you? (laughs) Sean lets me have a few, but they have to look nice. If it looks cluttered, he doesn't like that. Yeah, it's got to go. Yeah. Uh, But I wanted to ask for parents listening that are absolutely loving everything they're hearing and they want to work with their classroom, with the teacher, Hmm. what would you recommend? Because you work with both. You work with parents and teachers. What What would you say to the mom that's like, hey, my child is struggling. How can I kind of create, foster some kind of like cooperative something with the teacher to really work on this together? Mm, So important. So a lot of teachers actually do have like a kind of get to know my child type of thing that they will send out. Or, I mean, I guess that would be more typical in the early years. Mm. So if there isn't an opportunity to connect in person, you know, even before that first set of parent teacher interviews, I would say it's never too early you know, to kind of reach out. So as a teacher, I do like to reach out in September and just touch base with people. Um, So if you haven't heard from your classroom teacher in September and you do have some concerns, be brave and send an email. Mm. Um, And if you prefer to talk on the phone, just say, I would love to talk about how my child is doing so far in school. I encourage communication early and often. Okay. It just, it's the best way to be a team. And teachers don't mind that. Not we don't. We don't want to be that parent. No, <laughs> no. I know what you mean, but honestly, knowing that here's what I will say about that: to not be that parent. Yes, <laughs> that you're talking about. Yes. Make sure that when you're communicating, especially if your child is coming home and saying this happened at school or this happened at school or my teacher said this or did this, mm. don't take that for the complete truth. Take that and go okay, this is an opportunity to ask some questions. <laughs> Take a minute, read it, calm down. Maybe Ru- maybe wait 24 hours, the 24-hour rule? Write an email, let it sit in your drafts for 24 hours. Yep, yep. <laughs> and, wise. And say, I would love to talk more about this. This is what my child said, but I'd like to hear a little bit more about what's happening. Mm. And and I really appreciate that as a, as a teacher because things can be misunderstood or... <laughs> taken the wrong way or there's 100%. a lot of room for error with with uh anyway i yeah i yeah. just think that would that's the fair way and and, and then the you're most coming, effective way you're coming across as hey i want to i want to work on this together yeah, as definitely. opposed to feeling like you're accusing that's right yeah huh. one of um one of the primary teachers in my kids life said something so fun it was i think the first parent teacher day and she said i'll make you a deal i promise to believe if you promise to believe half of what my kid tells you about me, <laughs> yeah. I'll promise to believe half of what your kid tells me about you. Exactly. <laughs> about what they're saying about at home. Yes. Or, yeah, yes. I know. That's a really good example. <laughs> uh, so that is that is great advice. Yeah. Let's not be that accusatory, if that's a word. Yeah. Let's be a team. Let's be a team and work on this together. Let's build resiliency, help our kids develop character work on the emotions and let's help ourselves do the work so that we can be present in them so that we're not being triggered ourselves. Thank you so much, Julie. You're welcome. This is so great. I could talk about it all day. (laughs) Me too. Me too. We're going to, we're going to go for lunch now. We're going to just nerd out over all of this. (laughs) That's awesome. Thanks for listening to the Families Matter Most podcast with Jen Dean, part of the Saskatchewan Podcast Network. If you are interested in contacting Jen for one-on-one parent coaching, for speaking engagements, or just to get a little more information, please visit our website, familiesmattermost.com.